Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and ep- welcome to episode 121 of the Monday Night Review. I hope you are all well. I'm back in the eight, uh, 11-year-old's bedroom today. We had friends staying for two weeks and I took them to the airport at 3.30 yesterday morning. And I was not prepared, so I just shoved everything on my desk in my office to make their bedroom look nice. And if I go in there now... Nothing will get done except for some extravagant uh, repiling of stuff. So I'm in the 11-year-old's bedroom. For Christmas last year, his godfather, on request, got him an incense waterfall, which he loves. It's got like a little Japanese mountain village feel. It smells like a bong. It smells like a bong. (laughs) walked into his room and was like wow and then I remembered what it was and he's like I don't mind the smell and I think well probably you should get used to it so I'm I'm in the bong room I started watching something I, there I'm really bad about starting new television episodes I like comedy and true crime documentaries and some other documentaries but that's about it. And people are constantly recommending stuff to my husband. And he has quite a different sense of humour to me. And so sometimes we just start watching stuff and I think, oh, I, I can't do it. Or we start watching stuff. We went through a phase of watching really good stuff when I was pregnant. And then I would have hormonal feelings and dreams and it would all be too much. So we had to stop watching them. So we never got to the end of Friday Night Lights, even though I loved it. But, but because I was just too hormonal and emotional and something that someone's been... So he's got this list on his phone of of things that people have been recommending to him, and he always wants to watch them when I'm just not in the mood or when I'm writing a podcast. So it's really bad. We always end up either watching, re-watching something like A Midsummer Murders or we are watching CSI at the moment, which I always resisted and actually really enjoy. I love, I love the nerds. So we end up watching that, but on... Saturday night, it was my friend's last night, we knew we had to get up at 3.30 and so we wanted something light-hearted and easy to watch. So we started watching Colin from Accounts, which loads of people had recommended to me. My husband kept ignoring me when I said Colin from Accounts because our accountant is called Colin and he didn't, he hadn't been recommended it so he didn't realise what I was talking about. It was really funny. It's not at all what I, I thought it was going to be like a, if anyone's seen the film Office Space, which is very funny, but I thought it was going to be like something like that. It's not at all. It's very, very funny. So if you need a TV recommendation that is funny, Colin from Accounts is my recommendation to you. I'm currently reading um, The Devil You Know, Encounters in Forensic Psychiatry by Eileen Horn and Gwen Adshead. Uh which I really recommend if you're interested in British psychology. Not obviously that it's specifically British, but she's basically a British psychiatrist working with prisoners. And so it's very interesting, but it's quite heavy going. And I had pre-ordered, I very rarely will pre-order a book, but I pre-ordered a book and it arrived and it, I just wanted to sit in my bed and read it. I, Notes from the Hen House by Elspeth Barker. It was just a delight. It's sort of short stories and essays published posthumously by her family. And it's just lovely Norfolk country living insights of sort of comfort and chaos and argus and chickens in the kitchen, if that's your jam just really lovely so it was quite a nice palate cleanser from the encounters in psychiatry today's story i mean recommended by my sister jess she always seems to recommend the most harrowing episodes i i did it i did loads of research i wrote it i i had my shit together and then Basically, it's not a long story, so I would see snippets of it and, you know, I thought I had it all covered. But then I found a BBC documentary marking the 25th anniversary with footage, 
the original radio calls, interviews with the families, interviews with the people who did the rescue. And it was completely heartbreaking. And I, it's just dominated my thoughts ever since. Today, we're going to talk about the Penley lifeboat disaster. It's a tearjerker if that's the sort of thing that jerks your tears. Bit of history, because we do have non-British listeners, which I love. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution, known as the RNLI, is the largest charity that saves lives at sea around the coast of the United Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, as well as doing... um, flood evacuations and that kind of thing. It was founded in 1824 as the National Institution for the Preservation of Life from Shipwreck, which is more of a mouthful, by Sir William Hillary. The RNLI is principally funded by legacies, 65% of legacies and 28% donations, with the remainder coming from merchandising and investment. Most of the members of its lifeboat crews are unpaid volunteers. And until recently, most of these had some maritime background. So initially, and definitely in the 80s when this story takes place, they were fishermen, merchant seamen, um, and, and just families who lived by and on the sea who would do this in their spare time. Today, it has... 238 lifeboat stations and operates 444 lifeboats and operates flood rescue teams nationally and internationally. The latter prepare to travel to emergencies overseas at short notice. During the First World War, lifeboat crews launched 1,808 times, rescuing 5,332 people and with many younger men on active service, the average age of lifeboatmen was over 50. 19 RNLI lifeboats sailed to Dunkirk between the 27th of May and the 4th of June 1940 to assist the Dunkirk evacuation. In the Second World War, 6,376 lives were saved, with rescuing of downed air crew a frequent occurrence. My dog just came in and I got such a shock I nearly sprang out the window. The RNLI's lifeboat crews and lifeguards have saved more than 140,000 lives since 1824. And in 2015, crews rescued on average 22 people a day. The biggest rescue in the RNLI's history was on the 17th of March 1907, when the 12,000 tonne liner SS Suvik hit the main here reef next to Lizard Point in Cornwall. In a strong gale and dense fog, RNLI lifeboat volunteers rescued 456 passengers, including 70 babies. Crews from the Lizard, Cadwith, Coverack and Port Leven rowed out repeatedly for 16 hours to rescue all people on board. More than 600 people have died in the RNLI's service. Their names are inscribed on the RNLI memorial sculpture at the RNLI headquarters in Poole. I should say, I often say... And uh, give my apologies for my terrible uh, pronunciation of other languages. This includes Cornish. Very not good at my Cornish names. So I apologise. I've spent a lot of time in Cornwall, uh, but have not picked up the pronunciation. So we are, as, as you might know, we're going to one of my favourite places today, Cornwall, specifically to Mausel. And it's December 1981. It's before I was born. December 1981, and it, for those of you not familiar with Cornwall, if you look at the end of Cornwall and imagine that it's lobsters with it, a lobster with its two claws, Mausel is a fishing village below the tip on the top lobster claw. I'll put a map on social media. It, in an area of outstanding natural beauty, it's a close community, and they celebrate Christmas with the switching on of the Christmas lights and a big party for the fishermen every 23rd of December. But on the 19th of December 1981, the weather was deteriorating. A storm that had been brewing all day escalated as night fell. A number of people who were there that evening described the wind as screaming like they've never heard before or since. The Union Star was on her maiden voyage. 
sailing from Holland to Ireland. 935 tonnes, 70 metres, with a cargo of agricultural fertiliser. On board was Captain Henry Morton, mate James Whitaker, engineer George Sedgwick, crewman Angostino Verissimo and crewman Manuel Lopez. As well as the crew, she carried the captain's wife Dawn and two teenage stepdaughters, Sharon and Diane. They had joined the ship at an unauthorised stop in Essex so that the family could be together for Christmas. At 6pm on the 19th of December 1981, eight miles east of Wolf Rock Lighthouse near the south coast of Cornwall, disaster struck. The Falmouth Coast Guard received a call from the Union Star. You can hear all of these radio communications. One thing I would say is throughout all, no one sounds panicked. No one sounds scared. It is a real insight into the professionalism of everyone involved. The Union Star's engines had failed and could not restart. They had been offered help from a tug, which Morton had initially refused due to to the salvage costs. So basically, there's um, fees on salvage, and there's a big part of the RNLI that they state they do not do salvage. Since the dawn of um, ships and shipping and everything, we talked about it with the Mary Celeste, People are paid to salvage. They go and rescue the boats, rescue people, but they they charge a fee. So this tug had said, do you need help? Morton had said yes. And they said, well, you have to accept the salvage fees. And he said, no, you know, it's not my boat. I can't accept. I believe it was a £400 salvage fee. He is heard saying to the tug, if you could come close I don't think we need it. This was before he worked out what was wrong with the engine. The, the, to be on standby, that would be helpful. By the time he accepted the tug's help, fierce storms were underway. Winds were gusting up to 90 knots, which is 100 miles an hour, 170 kilometers an hour. Hurricane force 12 on the Beaufort scale with waves up to 60 feet. That's 18 meters high. The powerless boat was being pushed towards the treacherous Cornish coastline of Boscown Bay and... It's clear that Morton didn't realise, you can't, you're in the dark, in the winter, in this storm, you don't know how fast you're drifting to the the really dangerous rocks. We think of Cornwall as sort of beaches and family holidays. The coasts on Cornwall are incredibly dangerous. And by the time he accepts help from the tug, the tug is no longer able to get close enough to them to help As the ship is so close to shore, the Coast Guard at Falmouth calls for a Royal Navy Sea King helicopter, RNAS Coldrose. It used the call sign Rescue 80 during the mission and was flown by Lieutenant Commander Russell Smith, who was on secondment from the United States Navy. But they get out there. They're ready to hopefully winch people off. They actually have a man on a line nearly on the deck. But the wind is too violent. The storm is too much. And it's only when they realise that they've approached and they say, can you confirm you would like us to get people off the boat? And Morton says, yes, a woman and two children. And he literally has to say it three times because they can't they didn't know there was a woman and child on board a children on board and they're so shocked that you know they they shouldn't be there in a call between the union star and the sea king morton said the crew will stay on till the last it would later be discovered that morton's wife dawn was pregnant at the time as well which is just heartbreaking the union star was rolling from side to side but it's a flat bottom coaster so it, you know it just rolls with the waves and the mask was too high and at risk of colliding with the helicopter and the the lines were too short to give them any further distance and it was getting closer and closer to the shore. So it, it was all getting too dangerous to rescue. Very interestingly, the man on the end of the winch recalled that 
green, the new green paint on the deck and looking at it to gauge his landing and seeing a woman in pink court shoes uh, getting ready to come to him. That's how close they were um, before he had to be taken back up because it was too dangerous. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard had contacted the Penley lifeboat station at nearby Mausel to put them on standby should the helicopter rescue attempt fail. Coxon Trevelyan Williams, a trawler skipper by day, was asked to put a crew together and from the 12 volunteers that appeared, all mostly fishermen, merchant seamen, he picked the seven most able men to accompany him on the rescue. He chose second coxswain and mechanic Stephen Madron, assistant mechanic Nigel Brockman, emergency mechanic John Blewett, and crew members Charlie Greenow, Kevin Smith, a merchant seaman who happened to be home for Christmas, Barry Torrey and Gary Wallace. All men were volunteers and had worked together before and Richards refused to take Nigel's son, Neil, as he would never take two members of the same family on the boat at the same time. The lifeboat was the RNLB Solomon Brown, a wooden 47-foot, 14-metre Watson-class boat built in 1960 and capable of nine knots, 17 kilometres an hour. When you look at this boat and you look at... Any footage of a storm with 70 foot waves and hurricane force winds. The, even that, just going out in that boat, the, bra- the sheer bravery, it is tiny. A 47 foot boat is not big. The lifeboat was named after Quaker Solomon Brown of Landrake following a bequest presented by his daughters. The air rescue team called off their attempt when it became clear that their lines were too short and the mast was too tall to effect a safe rescue. And the Solomon Brown launched at 8.12pm. The weather so bad that it took skilled seamanship to even get it launched and and then it headed out into the storm. It was like being in a washing machine as it made its way to the drifting Union Star, which had already lost one anchor and was desperately held in position by its last remaining anchor. They had checked the engine and there had been... Seawater had got into the engine, which meant there was no chance of it starting. The Union Star is now just a mile away from the, the coast. It was by the time the Solomon Brown reaches the Union Star, it is just a mile away from the coast and it takes them a long time to be even able to get close enough. They with this, now it's in the surf. So if you think about the you've got these huge waves, but the closer you get to the coast, the more it becomes like surf and you've got a flat bottom boat. So the Union Star would roll about 50% on its side and when she rolled, the lifeboat would come up on her side out of the water. And not only are they everyone in con- constant contact with the, with the Coast Guard, but they have a man up in a watchtower with binoculars who had initially been asked to go up there so he could definitely see the Union Star to direct the lifeboat. But he is then also watching this unfold, as are the helicopter crew who have stayed above them. So they just keep seeing the the lifeboat coming completely out of the water on the side of the, the Union Star. After it's made several attempts to get alongside, four people jumped across the lifeboat and they're now about 300 yards from the coast with 60 to 70 foot waves it's trevelyan williams comes through to the coast guard and says we've got four off male and female there's two left on board then the communication just stops this is the last that's heard from either vessel the it's such a distressing thing to listen to because they'd got four people off the weather had deteriorated so much that the helicopter crew started to turn back. They thought they, they've got the four people off. They're just going to have to leave now to get home. So they themselves started to turn around and they believed that the crew on the lifeboat were not prepared to leave people behind and went back in for another attempt. 
to listen to the radio calls, it, Trevelyan Williams says there's there's four left on board. Then it just cuts out, and then you just hear the Coast Guard saying, "This is Falmouth Coast Guard to Penley lifeboat over." Falmouth Coast Guard to Penley lifeboat over, and there's just this silence, this deafening silence. Ten minutes later, they have a report from the watch tower on the coast, on the, on the cliff, to say that the lights of the lifeboat can be seen coming towards New Lynn, which is the next harbour over. And there's hope. Everyone just hopes that there's something up with the radio. They've decided to get just get to the quickest way home and they're heading to New Lynn. But no lifeboat comes and there's never been any explanation for what those lights were. Lieutenant Commander Russell Smith, who was watching the rescue from the helicopter above, later said, The greatest act of courage that I have ever seen and am ever likely to see was the penultimate courage and dedication shown by the Pen Lee crew when it manoeuvred back alongside the casualty in over 60-foot breakers and rescued four people shortly after the Penley had been bashed on top of the casualty's hatch covers. They were truly the bravest eight men I've ever seen, who were also totally dedicated to upholding the highest standard of the RNLI. So Russell Smith said that at one point he saw the lifeboat literally lying across the deck of the Union Star. It had gone on top um, and then had just slid off. Lifeboats were summoned from Senan Cove, the Lizard and St Mary's to try and help their colleagues from Penley and the Sea King helicopter refuelled, washed the salt out of the engines and went back out. The Senan Cove lifeboat found it impossible to make headway round Land's End. The Lizard lifeboat found a serious hole in its hull when it finally returned to its slip, slipway after a fruitless search. At daybreak on the 20th of December, the Union Star was found capsized on the rocks by Tatadu Lifehouse, showing paint from the lifeboat and broken lines still attached. Rescue divers blew a hole in the side to try and save anyone trapped in an air pocket in the wreckage. This then caught fire. They also saw a lifeboat life jacket with its lights still on, which confirmed their worst fears. It's also a horrible point worth noting that your life jacket is designed to stay on you. So the fact that the life jacket had come off meant the person in the jacket had probably been dashed on the rocks and broken up. As wrecked Debris from the lifeboat began to wash ashore. 200 volunteers set out to find any survivors. The only whole body they found was Nigel Brockman. They were able to find parts of eight other bodies, four from each vessel. Some volunteers searched solidly for seven days. There's an interview in the BBC documentary of a man who had volunteered. He's quite old. So he had volunteered to go out that day. He was a lifeboatman and he found limbs of his colleagues. And 25 years later, he was basically unable to speak about it. It just must have been unfathomably awful. Between them, the eight between the eight, them the eight crew members of the Solomon Brown left twelve children under ten fatherless. The press were everywhere. One wife, Barry Tory's wife, said she that there was just impossible for them to grieve privately because there was press everywhere. The ashes of Dawn and one of her daughters were scattered at sea, which. I find very difficult. I, I would not want to let it be known if I if I die at sea, I do not want to be scattered at sea. 
the other daughter and the body of Henry Morton were never found. In fact, Henry Morton's mother spent the rest of her life hoping, convinced that he had somehow survived and suffered amnesia and he would come home. He would suddenly remember who he was and come home. I think it really highlighted that not have, you know, obviously it's very distressing for to only have parts of the bodies, but to have no- nothing must be incredibly upsetting. Trevelyan Williams was buried on the morning of the 24th of December and Nigel Brockman in the afternoon. The Christmas lights, which had been turned on by one of the crewmen a couple of days, I believe on the 17th of December, were switched off and actually the widows went to the committee and requested that they were turned back on on the 23rd. They had an inquiry into what happened that some people seem to blame Henry Morton saying that he should have accepted the tug uh, when he had the opportunity. I would say that Henry Morton throughout sounds calm, not worried. There was a slight criticism, I think, that he had women and children on board, but it was supposed to be a standard delivery, probably one he'd done a number of times before. And... He does, and you know, did did having his his wife and and stepchildren cloud his judgment? And I I don't think so. I think if you could say to him, it's this or or death, you know, of course. But if you're working and someone is saying to you, oh, I'll come and do it for four hundred quid, I don't think it, you you know, if you don't think it's that bad. He didn't realise how close to the coast he was getting and drifting. Uh. Of course, with hindsight, you would have done things differently. He sounds incredibly calm. Trevelyan Williams, when he's saying his last message to the Falmouth Coast Guard, sounds very calm as well. So, to me, if anyone's at fault, and no one is, but I would feel incredibly bad if I was the tug person and I could see clearly that they were getting too close to the coast for rescue i personally would go and get them for free argue about the money in the pub afterwards argue it through lawyers do you know what i mean don't just leave a boat to crash don't leave a boat to be rescued by volunteers in a tiny boat who are all able, very able, capable seamen, but it was an unusually bad storm. The inquiry found that the loss of the Union Star and its crew was because of irreparable failure of the ship's engines due to contamination of fuel by seawater while off a dangerous lee shore the extreme severity of weather, wind and sea, and the capsize of the vessel on or shortly after stranding. The loss of the Solomon Brown was in consequence of the persistent and heroic endeavours of the coxswain and his crew to save the lives of all of the Union Star. Such heroism enhances the highest traditions of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution in whose services they gave their lives. And one thing I thought was incredibly interesting is that you heard from Barry Torrey's wife, Nigel Brockman's two sons, crew members, sister-in-law, brother-in-law's daughters. Not one of them seemed resentful. They were sad. They were incredibly proud. But they were like, that's the deal. That's what you sign up for. That that you know they they were ready to go out as you know it was a terrible storm and yet there were 12 volunteers ready to go out notably within days of the disaster enough people from Mausel had volunteered to form a new lifeboat crew 
1983, a new lifeboat station, still known as the Penley, was opened in nearby New Lynn, where a faster, larger boat could be kept moored afloat in the harbour, which is usually what happens now. Neil Brockman, who had been refused a place on the crew of the Solomon Brown, as his father Nigel was the assistant mechanic, and Trevelyan Williams didn't want to take two men from the same family, he later became the coxswain of the station's seven-class lifeboat and is marvellous at it, apparently. he He's such an appealing man when you see him interviewed. He has a twinkle in his eye. He looks quite like his father and... People are like, he's just brilliant at it. He had to be persuaded into it. He took over at 28, which is comparatively young. I believe Trevelyan Williams was 50. Um, you know, to be a coxswain of a, of a lifeboat, it was a, you know, it has a great authority with it. It's a, it's a great honour. And so he said initially he refused, but they really pushed for him to do it. And apparently it's a role he was born to do and he does it brilliantly. And he says there's absolutely no doubt in his mind that when he sails out with his crew, there's another eight men sailing out with them. The old boathouse at Penley Point with its slipway is kept the same as it was when the lifeboat launched and a memorial garden was created beside it in 1985 to commemorate the crew of the Solomon Brown. In 2023, the Boathouse, Slipway, Memorial Garden, Retaining and Boundary Walls were designated together a Grade 2 listed building. And I think partly, obviously, that's because of what happened. But also now that lifeboats are often kept ready in the water and because of the technology has come a, a long way, if you look at the Penley original Slipway, and imagine a 47-foot boat being pushed into a storm down the slipway. You know, it, it's quite, a, you know, I'm, I'm finding it hard to find words. It's quite a feat to see. The disaster was the last time the RNLI lost an entire crew in action. Coxon Trevelyan Williams was posthumously awarded the RNLI's gold medal for gallantry and the rest of the crew were awarded bronze medals. The names of the eight Penley crew members who valiantly fought to save those on board the Union Star are inscribed on the RNLI memorial in Poole and their pictures, it's the first thing that current members of the Penley lifeboat see when they enter the station. That One of the current members said there's, there's just no way that you would ever forget what they did and not try to live up to their memory and do them proud because as soon as you open the door their faces are there that's what you see and I believe I could be wrong but I believe in the Penley the original lifeboat station their boots are there their things are there as they probably a lot of things got taken by their families but their boots are lined up as they would be ready for when they got into their lifeboat kit. Every year on the 19th of December, the Christmas lights at Mausel are dimmed between 8 and 9pm in memory of the 16 people who lost their lives, leaving just the cross and angels shining down across the village and out to sea. Today, 97% of RNLI crews are volunteers and they saved 389 lives in 2022. I should say there's loads of volunteer positions at the RNLI. It was very interesting. I have a fear of the sea. Not, I mean, I'll swim in it. I'm, I'm not a bit, bit boats. I'm not great with boats. I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm, I have a healthy fear of the sea, let's say. So I never thought it was for me. But looking on the RNLI website, there's loads of positions for volunteers to just help with fundraisers and that kind of thing so if that's something that you fancy doing we talk about I, I'm a life coach and I talk a lot about how ways that you can improve your life or add to your life add to your experience and volunteering is a huge thing but often it can feel like where, where to start, how to start. And so if you're someone, for example, my husband loves sailing, loves boats and used to deliver boats across the world, which he doesn't do anymore. 
So for him, volunteering at the RNLI would be great. I would hate for him to go on the boats because, as I said, scared of the sea. But yes, so if that was something that has spoken to you in this episode and you would like to have a look, go and have a look. You can donate. It's just such an amazing thing. And I always remember when I was a child, we used to go every year to Cornwall on holiday and there was a lifeboat at Port Isaac that I I always just remember um, it being there. It was just this thing ready to go there is just something about the bravery of people who are just ready to go into an area that's already in distress you know even if you're just going to help people not in storm conditions or whatever you're you're ready to just throw yourself into a situation to help other people which is incredibly gallant and selfless and that is the story of the Penley lifeboat disaster I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really recommend the BBC documentary. There is something about that documentary. It gives you a real sense, I feel, of the Cornish community and how the sea is part of their lives. And I think Neil Brockman says, fishermen, you you live on the sea, you work on the sea. It's part of the deal is that you take a risk on the sea and it's a risk that we're willing to take. And the the families that are interviewed are quite unemotional in in that that in the way they talk about it. You know, I wasn't worried. This is something they had to do. They did it often, well, not often, but you know, it was it, it was usual. If the lifeboat gets called, they go, and it wasn't anything to be worried about. And I thought that was very interesting, and that's also what made. Them, a number of people saying the wind, the scream of the wind was unusual and I haven't heard it before or since. And lots of people said that, but no one said, oh, there was something about that night that I felt wasn't right. Everyone said it was just another normal call out. You know, the, the weather was terrible, but it was just another normal call out. Um, so there's no mythology around it you know there was something in the air that was sinister blah, blah, blah. the wind was bad the wind made this noise that people noted but there's yeah I, it's just it gives you this this very firm idea of these fishing communities and their life with and on the sea so I really recommend it if you've found this podcast episode interesting I would like to say a huge shout out to to a couple of people who on social media tagged me. Um, Someone was asking for true crime podcast recommendations and about three or four people tagged, tagged me and said they loved the podcast. It really means a lot. I appreciate it. Um, I've also heard on a couple of podcasts that I listen to that at the moment, Apple won't automatically download your next episode of podcasts that you follow, any podcast that you follow, if you don't have enough storage on your phone. So I am terrible because I will find a podcast that I like. And if I don't follow it, I might sometimes forget it exists and miss loads of episodes. So if you like this podcast, for any podcast that you like, make sure you follow it. Not only is that great for the podcast person, people, but it's means that you don't have to worry about missing episodes. They will automatically download. But now Apple are only doing it where they automatically download if you have space on your phone. So go and have a tidy up of your phone. Take this as a prompt to to make sure you've got got a nice uh, tidy phone. Delete that stuff that you don't need. Have a autumnal clean of your of your phone to free up space because it's just a very annoying thing if you're missing um, episodes and I'd really appreciate any reviews if you review wherever you listen to it makes a big difference I'm as I've said before I'm just one woman on her own Uh, and so any help that you give me is absolutely appreciated so reviews sharing telling your friends is absolutely fantastic. If you have anything that you want to talk to me about, 
you can email the Monday Night Review at gmail.com. You can find me on social media at the Monday Night Review, where I will post pictures to go with this. Um, and there are links, there's t shirts that you can buy. I would say that I really made sure that the t shirts we have and the hoodies we have are ethical, fair trade, really nicely made, and they are really, really comfortable to the extent that I can mostly be found wearing my own merch as can my husband just because it's super soft so if like me you have a man at home who does not know what he wants for Christmas because he has bought himself everything he wants go and check out the t-shirts have a little look um but yeah so there's also book a bookshop link below um, which I need to update, but that's got books that I've read and enjoyed, books that I want to read and enjoy. Um, so that's kind of helpful if you are a reader. Also, I love bookshop.org because it supports bookshops rather than Amazon. And if you want extra content, go and join the Patreon. There's extra mini-sodes, mini-episodes, and stories from Holly. And there hasn't been an extra mini sewed for a little, for, I think for two weeks, because I've had people staying. So don't you worry, you will get them back. You will not go without. And until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive.